Dankeschön. Uh, okay, so, uh, ich war mir nicht sicher, ob ich das auf Englisch oder auf Deutsch machen soll. Who doesn't really, who would like it to be in English? I don't mind, it's even easier for me. Thank you very much. It's my people here. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, how many of you actually attended my talk in Munich? It's not the same talk, don't worry. Okay, uh, it might be similar, but it's actually, there are many things. Mark didn't give me enough time, so I wasn't able to, you know, show everything I wanted, but now I have all the time in the world. It's like, we are not supposed to finish by eight or nine or 10. We can go for, you know, my, my biggest record is actually in Munich, where we had a session starting from 6.30 in the evening and went all the way until half past 11. I don't know about you, but it's not like I have many plans tonight. <laughs> so I'm just saying, and we do have a lot of stuff to go through. So this is the full deck, full experience that you have to. And I had to skip 137 so we could get anywhere today. So let's do it. So. It was not a joke, by the way, it's serious. So, uh, now this is me, this is how I used to look like back in the day. Things changed a lot over time. Uh, still smashing the magazine like 11 and a half years later. That's been quite a journey, actually. And so we moved recently from this beautiful, clean, white design to this. Which is maybe clean, but very red. In a way, even Chinese red, I would say. But, you know, you can always turn it off. There is a button here saying, you know, bring red back, or seriously red, which you can use. But we're not going to talk about this today. Uh, there is a lot of stuff that we went through. Uh, I want to kind of look into what is happening today in terms of front end. I mean, for me, it's always a mystery. Every single Friday, I have to look up of what the hell has been released now. And every single Friday, it feels like it's been accelerating ever since, like next, like last, like today, on a, well, if it's a Friday, it's like five times faster than it was like a week, week ago. So it's, it's really, really crazy. And so every single Friday, so I'm going, to, I'm actually preparing new stuff and new slides to increase this, uh, to bring it all in here. And so what I want to cover today is kind of some of the interesting things, because there are so many of them really, some of the interesting things that are happening that are really important for us to know and to master today. And because most talks are boring, and most workshops are boring, I thought that we could actually make it interesting by turning it into a game. <laughs> we don't have a sound. There was, really, there was a really nice dramatic effect. That's the best I can do. <laughs> I'm sorry. But that's okay. So this is a game we're going to play. And it's not very complicated, but it requires some effort from your side. So we'll need your help. And so we're going to go through maybe like seven to eight different things, different, you know, interesting new challenges that came up. And I'm going to ask a question and you are going to respond to it, right? This is really simple, no difficult rules, right? Perfect timing, I think, yes. But before we get there, I need to know how dirty do we want to play. So you need to tell me, right? Do you want to take it easy today? Medium? or go all the way. So, who wants to take it easy? <laughs> I mean, it was a long day, I get that, that's okay. Medium? <laughs> mm, so, you are really weird. <laughs> okay, so most of you want to go all the way? Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, yeah, I might need to jump at some point, but we will see. Uh, by the way, how many of you, who is actually more on the design side of things and not code? Who is more on the code side of things and not design? It's very mixed. I think I need to change my slides now. Okay, uh, so I'm going to jump a little bit because I have something prepared. It's actually coming before all of these slides, so it's your fault now. Uh, but I want to start to kind of warm up with something that's been really interesting and important. Uh, for me, not like, it's, it's really general, I know, it's not necessarily like related to front-end technologies. But I think that there are some really interesting things happening today, and it has to deal with how we work and the personality that shines through in our interfaces. And there is this fantastic quote by Mark Bolton, who said once, that the design process is weird and complicated, 
because it involves people and systems and organizations, which often are weird and complicated. I think it's true in many different things, especially in e-commerce sites in Germany, which I worked with <laughs> a lot. But that's a different story. That's a different story. And the reason for it is because there are many assumptions about how we as designers or developers or creative, because all of us are creatives, work. Very often we think, and many people like us think, and many managers tend to think, that we start somewhere in a creative process and go, and we iterate and iterate and improve things and keep iterating, keep iterating until, we're di no, until we hit the finish line, right? And then we are done. But this is not reality. The reality is much messy and much more unpredictable and much more, much more complicated. Because we have to start somewhere, obviously, but then we explore different things, maybe frameworks, maybe different techniques in terms of you know, front-end techniques, maybe different design patterns that we're using, interface solutions, like all the things that we know of. And we keep exploring, and until at some point we hit a dead end, well, then we need to find something else. We have to reroute and kind of try to find something else, another solution. And then we do it over and over again. And this point when we hit that dead end is the point when we're losing time. And nobody likes losing time. I don't like losing time. And I'm sure that you don't like losing time. So we tend to rely on things that used to work in the past, right? Many of us have seen this thing, the tweet from last year or two years ago, actually now. Uh, essentially, which one of these two possible designs are you designing today? Because there is only two. There is one on the left and one on the right. And there are sometimes differences in the placement of a carousel, which is sometimes at the bottom, sometimes on the top and sometimes in both places, because why not, right? And so very often we tend to create quite generic designs, right? And I ask myself, is it really the best we can do? Have we been doing the same thing over and over and over again? Of course, if you've been working on a button, you know, for a year, for two, for three years, you will be designing perfectly wonderful, perfect button that might you know, drive your conversion like crazy. But is it really the best option we've come so far? If we look into the you know, toolbar design from 1987 until 2017, just for the record, it's 30 freaking years, right? 30, it hasn't changed much. Right? So you can look into it like a B testing of things kind of evolving over time, right? It gets better, maybe darker. We can see it getting darker, right? But is it really the best we can do? Maybe today in 2018 is about time to really think about what would be a much, much, much better way of designing this kind of experience. Because if we keep iterating like an A-B testing kind of way, we're going to end up with this, right? We can you know, improve form over and over and over again, but is the form really a good thing anymore at all? Because we can use you know, some smart autocomplete here for exactly the same task, which is actually much easier. So if we keep A-B testing all the time, this is not good enough. We are not, we're going to stand on the same maximum of the local scope that we're at. So maybe sometimes we need to do A-Z testing, where we bring in two very different designs, two very, very com kind of competing designs to find a better one. And you know, we will see this kind of stuff happening over and over again. It's crazy. It's like beating the horse to its final death, right? <laughs> Facebook's bottom enough. Somebody is really passionate enough to track every single change happening in the Facebook's bottom nav, and sometimes there are three or four changes happening, and they're all being tracked. Maybe a little bit more shadow, maybe a little bit more border radius. How many of you have been in this situation before? Border radius, 11 pixels. <laughs> and then a month later, somebody says, no, 12. <laughs> Let's make 12 is better. And then maybe two months later, 13. That's the last one. 13, right? Does it really matter? Do we embed some sort of personality in our design by kind of manipulating these pixels and adding some shadows and moving it a bit, one pixel to the left and one pixel to the right? I'm not sure, I don't think so. Because it's also about maybe trying to break out of it. We also tend to rely on things that used to work in the past, like based on our experience. We like data like this, like two out of 1,000 mobile users tap on share buttons. That's a, f that's a really interesting statistic to know of. Or another thing, 90% of permission prompts are dismissed or ignored by default without even being read because we don't expect them to be meaningful, right? Um, and if we look into it, like around all, all those practices we used to work, kind of we rely on and you know, statistics we used to rely on, um, and kind of brings me to this important point. 
where I attended this talk by a Danish designer. I'm totally off at this point out of, in terms of time, but I think it's really interesting and important. I will get to the front and stuff as well, I promise. But he said a couple of things which kind of stuck with me for quite some time, and he said that something that everybody says, right? We want to stand out today, we need to delight customers with a remarkable attention to detail. All right, yes, we all have heard that. But if I look into websites like this, which I guess is remarkable and delightful in many ways, can you imagine just for a second how much time, how, much, how many people, how many resources, how much money, how much effort had to go into this little website to make it happen? It's not something you can do on a weekend. I don't think so. And you need a really nice budget to make it work as well, make it all responsive and you know, utilize all the wonderful front-end technologies. I can't do that. Nobody can afford doing that. In the same way, I don't think that anybody, sorry about this for a second, can afford creating like a long-form read article like this, which is a fantastic storytelling, right? But this is an incredible amount of work. Not everybody can afford it. And to be honest, nobody should have to afford it because it's a freaking really a lot of work. Not everybody can do that. And then he continued, that designer continued saying, kind of bringing in the play, the storytelling and art direction as being an essential component of today's design experience, of today's design process when we are creating our experiences. And when I think about storytelling, and he says storytelling through great art, di art direction are what it all boils down to. When I think about this, I think about this, or maybe, you know, this. And if I'm really, really super creative, maybe this. But I definitely do not think about this being storytelling. For me, this is not storytelling, just, you know, okay, Uber is a service, like, you know, many others. I don't have any connection to Uber, I've been using it for a while, but I have a problem with Uber, and my problem is, if there was a service that maybe 10 cents cheaper on average, I would jump to that service right away. I don't have any emotional connection to Uber at all, but at the same time, I have a very strong emotional connection to MailChimp. I don't know how many of you use MailChimp. I'm not affiliated with them at all, by the way. But there is a lot of humanity that goes into crafting that interface. And because I know some people working at MailChimp, the interface also reflects the people working there, which I think is really, really cool. So one of the things they do is producing these color books that they just give away for free to everybody to use. And this is nice. So in a way, this is impossible not to love. Just impossible. For example, hi, I'm Freddy. It's fun to be me. Is it fun to be you? <laughs> now, how can you answer it in a negative way? Like, I'm no fun. I'm like, no fun at all. I'm just horrible, horrible, horrible human being. And it just keeps going, right? And th there is no button saying MailChimp, the most awesome company in the world, or MailChimp, hey, buy me now, because they're a boring company in a way. They're selling a boring product. They try to pop it up and make it a bit more interesting, but it's email. What's more boring than email? There's nothing more boring than email. But they induce humanity into everything they do. And one of the things that they do is this freaking button. Right? Or this illustration. I mean, this thing alone kind of really shows the humanity of a person who is about to push that button that's going to send an email to 200,000 people. Right? That's exactly the feeling that you kind of have in there. Right? And so when you press it, they have this high five thing. And I think that to me personally, this animation alone is what really creates this emotional connection. So it's really hard for me to move away from MailChimp even if I want it. So this thing, Right, storytelling, art direction, it's all kind of really stuck with me. And I think the way of getting there to introduce more, or kind of less generic designs and more authentic designs is by having some sort of personality in your product and moving away from being frictionless and perfect. And I think that's, it's about time that we as a generation of designers who've been kind of grew up with this notion of don't make me think, maybe it's about time for us to actually start making people think a little bit, not too much but a little bit. And I was thinking about what would be a nice way of doing it to introduce some sort of friction, but in a nice and friendly way to keep things memorable. Now, how can you do it? Now, here's this one example of Tijuana Flats, which is a chain of restaurants in the US, and they look like this. You might not like it, it's not so important. They have this zombie style, it's all over the place in everything that they do. And it's 
you know, it's quite an effort. And, you know, these are the people sitting there. <laughs> and these are the walls. So it's pretty big walls, right? And so every three or four months or so, they're hiring graffiti artists to come in there and actually, you know, repaint the walls and unfold that story that they actually started telling. And of course, the restaurant menu actually reflects this kind of identity. Again, you might not like it, but it's kind of fitting. And of course, the website should do the same thing, right? And so this is the website. And you might hate it, you might like it, it's not so important, I guess. But it kind of reflects that identity. Now, in the spirit of 2017, right, of all of us, I think, hating parallax, hating carousels, striving for performance, striving for accessibility, striving for uh, getting rid of web fonts and everything like crap on the web, right? They moved away from this design to this design. Which I think is wow on so many levels, right? <laughs> Not because it's, it's really fast, it's fully accessible, right? It doesn't use any web fonts, there is no texture because God forbid texture, texture is horrible for rendering performance, right? Um, so it's all very clean and shiny in a way and it's very accessible. But there is a lot, lot left on the way, kind of sideways, moving from this design to this design. I would rather prefer them to have this one and have more websites looking like this than like this. And no company knows it better than Blumberg, who creates these kind of things just to bring attention to themselves, in a way, but also to kind of reinvent themselves. They had a big problem, and the problem was Blumberg wasn't seen as a you know, as a real competitor in a way. They were very much like everybody else, Financial Times, NBC News, and others. And so they tried to be different in a way, and they hired a bunch of designers who were given the freedom to do whatever they wanted. And as you can see, they did whatever they wanted, <laughs> right? When was the last time you used Marquee Tag? <coughs> when was the time you used Blink? No, maybe it's about time to bring it back, because one of the things that they do desperately, and you will never forget this one, is actually bringing on all the all things that you might or might not like. Now, you might not like this feature, and again, this is kind of something that's... I mean, you have no idea what's expecting you here. But this is maybe like one of those attempts. You might have seen this, like Dropbox rebranding and, you know, this kind of things from Blumberg and many other websites are actually trying to do the same thing, um, which is like a brutalist design in a way, right? Where you want to be different just, I guess, to be different to bring in attention to yourself because everything else looks very similar, kind of coming back to this problem of generic design, right? But I think that maybe it's not necessarily the best way of doing it because not every company can afford it and not every company should actually have to do it. That's a bit crazy if you ask me. And so I ask myself, so what can you do, and this is kind of what I want to bring over here for this part, what can we do to bring in some personality to be less generic but not going all the craziness that, you know, Blumberg has, for example? Well, pick the most horrible, annoying, boring element. Who likes pop-ups? Nobody. So welcome to the best pop-up in the world. It's so delightfully annoying, I wish every single website had it. <laughs> right? And the reason why it works here is not because it's a pop-up, but because it actually fits in in the story that they're creating, with the illustration, with the style that they're having. Right? In the same way, you know, you may, many of you will have seen this before. So, you know, one kind of age selector where you have to define your age so you are legible, uh, um, old enough to enter the site. So try to make this a bit more interesting. So Austin Birox knows how to do it. Are you 21? You click yes, you just get to the site. No questions asked. If you, ask, if you click no, they ask you, okay, at least 18? Hmm. <laughs> okay, this is getting interesting. Right? And they kind of... <laughs> so once they see this, right, it's really... When well, somebody sees it, it's really, really impossible not to like it in a way. And I even wanted to buy their beer, although I don't, like even, I don't even like beer. There is no way to click yes here, by the way, which is nice. Right? Kind of really creates this emotional connection that you can do, and it doesn't require that much work. Right? Here's another one. Pick the most, here's another option, right? Pick not necessarily the most annoying thing, but the most boring thing. What could be more boring than the title attribute, the title element, right? Mr., Mrs., Miss. Boring. So maybe you can spice it up a little bit. You don't have to have like four or five options. Go all the way. 
who would you like to be today? I always wanted to be a prince. Now, maybe this is my option, my opportunity to become a prince. That sounds pretty cool. Why not? And you think that's it? No, 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 no. This goes all the way. It's like a really long thing. So maybe pick one boring element and try to make it a bit more interesting. Or just use animation in one point with consistently. Like this, for example. Right? And kind of it's, you clearly communicate that you care about somebody else's privacy. Right? And here's a version of it, number two, which is a bit more you know, advanced, where they're tracking what you're typing. Right? This is again about adding friction. So at this point, I felt like I don't want to fill it in fast. I want to type it as many characters as I can just to see what's going to happen to that look. Is it going to change its expression? I really feel like I really want to experience it. I had to type it and retype it just because I was so curious about it. Right? <laughs> and then eventually the same thing for password. That could be enough as well. Right? And sometimes, of course, you want to be a bit more strict. So here's one option as well. Just pick one style, for example, like the uh, slanting that you have over here and just use it consistently on all the buttons and all the menus and everywhere else, right? That's still pretty good. That still gives you some sort of a little bit different than what you might be expecting from other sites. And you can also use shapes. One of the first exercises we do is to say, what if you had to redesign whatever you are building today or designing today, but you couldn't use or you were not allowed to use any circles or rectangles? What would it be? What, is this something that is not a rectangle, not a circle? out there, or is it all rectangle and circles, and that's it. And then, once you have a concept, you can actually plug in all these old elements. And of course, you can also play with things like animations, and here's a nice example for it, where if you just remove all the silky animation you have, and especially the one that you will find now here in the rectangle area, it looks like every other portfolio website out there. That's it. And just this little touch actually adds something to it. Right? And so, I think that this is kind of important because one thing that we are missing a bit today is some level of respect, respect towards our customers. And I think it's very often it's also based because of, you know, we do A-B testing. And I think that there are many things that are kind of also left on the side. So just this form annoys me so much on so many levels. I'm sorry if you designed it. Um, this question, do you have children with a slider? I was very confused. That's very, very confusing. And I don't really understand why we would actually, as designers, do it. Somebody must have created it. There must be a good reason for it, I hope. That's just really, really strange. But at the same time, there are other things that we do. And there is another company that I always have liked to highlight because I like them so much. Um, Ryanair, and the reason why it's, I mean, they're redesigned, I know, but that thing I will never forget. When you actually buy a ticket, bought a ticket, on Ryanair a while back, four or five years ago. They had insurance added in for you automatically unless you know how to opt out, because you really need to know how to opt out. Because to opt out, you need to find, don't insure me, conveniently located between Denmark and Finland. <laughs> now that's for me, that's not just bad, it's really evil. That goes all the way, right? Um, but then, this is like, you know, has been a while you know, before it happened, but then, you all of a sudden, you might be stumbling upon things like this, which I think is another level entirely. It's even worse than Ryanair, at least to me, where you know that people don't like having hair on their phones, right? So you create an ad, and you mimic a hair on your ad in an image so that people accidentally click on it, right? Well, this is just disgusting on so many levels. It's unbelievable. Or even this. This is even better. So, you know, when you, somebody has marked your, article, your email as red, you want to bring it up again, right? So why don't you just make it look like it wasn't red, right? So people have an opportunity to re-see it again, right? That's just not cool, again, on so many levels. So I'm really happy to see that I hope at least to see that by being a bit more humane and authentic in what we're doing and avoiding things like that, uh, we can actually get to the point where we feel very respectful towards our customers. And I think that this is going to be the year where we're going to kind of get this back with privacy and with, um, with our attention to all these details, which is about time probably to move to level one.
Okay. Just a second. So, this is the kind of the part we're going to play a game. I think I'm going to need more than 45 minutes at this point. I'm sorry. Well, how much time do we actually have? Okay, I like you. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to go for a couple of things. We're probably going to have a break at some point, uh, I hope. Um, and we will see how it goes. But I think I, now I really do want to kind of bring in something that I think is also important just to know when we're working. And we can start with something very simple, like a compression. Right? Now, if you are asked to optimize the compression of your site as much as you humanly could, right? and I'm not talking about let's just gzip, no, 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 no. We have to go way deeper than that. Gzip is just the stand, starting point here. You really want to optimize the delivery of your text assets, not just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, of course, things like SVG and other things. Um, and you have to deal with you know, things to uh, send to you from the server, so it has to be like dynamic or static. Now, Gzip is just the start, right? Now, what would you use or do? You want to really go hardcore on text optimization. This is text, text is simple. There is nothing, no magic happening in text, right? No? Okay, I scared some. Who wants to leave? <laughs> okay, that didn't work either. Great, this is going to be great. Uh, right, so there are a couple of things. Like, first of all, gzip is the most common compression method. Uh, format. Uh, it's used pretty much consistently everywhere, and if you don't use it, please do use it for sure. But we need to keep in mind that each compression library, like Zlib for Gzip, uses or has different presets quality settings, and using ranging from fast compression, which is levels one to three, to good, like really, really slow, but really, really good compression levels four to nine. Most of the time, we'll be using something between three and five, I guess. But as developers, we care about two things. We care not just about transferred file size, that's one thing. We also care about compression and decompression speed for both st static and dynamic web content. And there are two new options, like one of them is Zopfli, and the other one is Brotli. Zopfli is backwards compatible, which means if you can turn it on on a server, please go ahead and do it today, or probably tomorrow. Um, but it's really backwards compatible, so everybody who supports Gzip will support it as well. But Brotli is a whole new compression decompression format, so for it to be supported, uh, it really needs to be supported in browsers. So it's kind of future compatible, but not backwards compatible. So unless you have a vast majority of your users not caring at all about Internet Explorer 11, well, you probably will need to provide you know, gzip as a fallback for E11. But for all the other browsers, you can actually go ahead and install Brotly. And also, of course, for Opera Mini, you will have to do the same thing like you do with IE. And so if you look into the data, you will find out that, in fact, both of them, they are actually quite similar in how they work. Uh, both of them have a really, really good saving option, right? So you can actually save up 14 to 40 percent of your on your text. And you have, if you have many, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all this stuff can be served, you know, faster, and that's great. So you would basically advertise that you're supporting Brotly, and the server you have to actually create a Brotly as well, and then you can say. I'm going to choose content encoding broadly if it's supported, but on the server, you'll probably have CSS, then gzip version, and the broadly version, right? And then you need to kind of do some uh, perform some configuration on Nginx on whatever server you're using, and then you can put it on. So it's really not a big deal most of the time. It just many people tend to forget about them and just turn on only gzip. But if you can, please uh, do that. The only thing to keep in mind there, though, is that whenever you're using Brotly or Zopfly, they're compressing much slower than Gzip. So you need to keep in mind that for dynamic assets, you can't really use them all the time. So you will have to kind of make some compromises. So a strategy for it would be to pre-compress static assets, like you know, CSS, SVG, JavaScript stuff with Brotly and Gzip, both uh, Gzip for fallback, on the highest level, as you know, the highest possible level, and then compressing dynam dynamic HTML on the fly with broadly at level one to four, otherwise it would take too much time. And of course, important thing to keep in mind, it's a good idea to serve assets through CDN there, and uh, server then would handle content negotiation if broadly is not supported. And you can, of course, go overboard and do things like this if you feel like it, where you can say, you know what, I care about every single character I'm using. So you could go ahead and replace all class names with emoji, because you can, essentially. 
right? And Bimoji perform, you know, compressed fairly well. I guess repeatability is a bit of an issue, right? And debugging is another issue. But apart from that, it's um, pretty interesting. You could give it a try, but I would not recommend it, right? So that's just in case. So this is what we can do with text. That's not too complicated, but you could go ahead and, you know, uh, do this kind of stuff. Something a bit more interesting is what you can do with images and what you can do with web fonts, which we're going to cover next. So with images, when you think about it, it shouldn't be a big problem because, you know, the images do not block rendering. But if you think about the amount of data we're sending through the network, we'll find out that actually the amount of bandwidth required for images is really, really significant. And so responsive images, as you probably know, with picture elements, source set and sizes and all this stuff, this is the default, and I think that many of you will be using a source set. Probably not picture element, not that often. But you can also automate many things there. So one of the things that I was involved with, and I was really happy to kind of do some consultancy on it, is Responsive Images Breakpoint Generator, which allows you to upload an image and then select the f uh, like, um, uh, ratio that you want to support. And then even say, OK, how many images you want, what do you want to support retina, or even size step, which means after, f after f uh, every 20 kilobytes or so, it is going to regenerate the image. right? And then it finds all the breakpoints almost magically, and then it spits out a list of all the images cropped properly, and even uses an intelligent gravity option, which is kind of an art direction option, to move or to crop the image to focus on the person or on the building or whatever is in the focus. And then you can download it, and then you can use the picture element or source certain sizes for it, right? So you don't have to write it. Okay, that's good, responsive images, nothing fancy there. But very often you have very particular, specific problems that you want to solve. And one of them is, hmm, what if you have this kind of thing? You have this image, and this image has a drop, well, you can't see it probably, but it has a backdrop, like drop shadow. shadow. So if you save it as JPEG, shadow doesn't compress well, so all these gradients will not look great, right? So, you know, JPEG is a problem. PNG is a problem as well, because PNG is going to be huge for this kind of thing. Now, you can use WebP, but again, WebP is not supported everywhere. So what do you do? That's an old problem. I'm sure you all have seen this article. Yes, something like that, I think. Uh, so you split it into parts. You say, OK, I have a part responsible for JPEG, and I have a part responsible for PNG, and I put one as a mask on top of another one. And so I have 270 kilobytes together, instead of having like maybe you know, 1.2 meg for PNG. Here. So you're just going to put it inside of an SVG container, like this, right? So you have a hero image SVG, and then you have an image mask, and then you have that actual mask, the alpha channel on top of it. And you plug it in as image hero image SVG or as a background image. But you know, this is just basic. We need to go deeper. Imagine that perfect article or that perfect page where you have to optimize the hell out of it as much as you can. Well, it depends on your ethics, how far you want to go. Because you can do this, and this is really great for performance, uh, where the idea is, well, certain things, certain qualities of image, images perform better than others or compress better than others. So you can say, hmm, yeah, I could remove all the contrast from that image, right? And it's going to make the size smaller. And then I'm going to bring it up back with the contrast in CSS, using CSS filter. The image, the final result will be the same, but of course, if somebody chooses to download this image, <laughs> right? So it's like, uh, you know, it's really on you, but you can really save on bandwidth, right? So here, if you look into the uh, big wide screen image, which is, I think, 1,200 pixels width, right? You can actually save almost a megabyte on this trick, right? So if you really want to deliver that image quickly, and you don't necessarily care about you know, people choosing to save that image, that might be a really nice option to consider. And this is the technique that Yuna Kravitz has developed. And you can actually read about it more here on CSS Tricks. That's pretty good. Another thing you can do, again, depending on how dirty do you want to play, and you apparently want to go all the way, so here you go. If you have two images with a displayed the same size, but one is dramatically small, uh, larger than the other, 
you can use, you can actually save a lot of data as well. Here's an example. If you have this image, which I think all of you will agree doesn't look particularly great. It looks pretty bad, actually, and it should be. It's 600 times 400, and it's saved in Photoshop with the worst possible quality. Right, so it doesn't look particularly great. But if you resize it and make it 300 times 200, and then compare it against an image which is natively 300 times 200 exported from Photoshop, most people will not be able to tell the difference between these two images, but the one on the right is 7 kilobyte, and the one on the left is 21 kilobyte. The thing that the browser has to do, of course, is scale down, and that means that for your image, you will have to blow it up two times, two times at least, save it with the worst possible quality, but then you're saving 66%. Now, you're really wasting browser's resources at this point, I have to say, and memory, of course. But if it's, you know, if it's small, relatively small images, and it's maybe two or three or four of them on your site, on a, on a, sorry, on a page, it will really boost the uh, you know, perceived performance of the site. So that's something to keep in mind. But that's not good enough, right? That's just dirty tricks. Let's go deeper. So you can say, huh, there is something else that performed fairly well that I can actually use to compress better. If you compare this image against this image, you'll find that the second one is approximately 90 kilobytes smaller. So what's the difference? The difference is blurriness, right? So if you blur out all the unnecessary details that are here in the background, if you look over here, you can save another 90 kilobyte. Okay, let's go deeper, because we like going deeper, right? So if we look into JPEGs and how they work, and JPEGs are the dominant format on the web, we find out there are two kinds of them. There is a sequential JPEG, the baseline JPEG, and progressive JPEG. The sequential one is when you come, kind of, the page, the, uh, the image is loaded from top to bottom, like, done, right? And then it's progressive JPEG, you see the something in the pretty bad quality right away, and then, and then it gets better over time. I really hope you appreciate the sound effects here. Okay, uh, so if you want to improve that progressive JPEG that you have, and this is a technique that Tobias Baldauf actually has developed, you can actually start playing with scan levels, because you know, the reason why it shows up in different ways, the progressive JPEG, is because you have different images which appear of one after another. You just need to make sure that your scan level, or that image in your scan level that you need, for that particular image, looks great. So if you look at the default scan level, they're not necessarily what you want. So because you have most of the time probably nothing to do on a Sunday or so, what you're going to do, of course, is try to play with matrices and try to figure out what would be the right way for the encoder to actually you know, compress your image in a perfect way. And then you'll find out that you know, some configurations work better than the others. And then you can make sure that you can ship fast and show soon by just having the right configuration. So you can say, here's my first scan level, which kind of shows the structure of that image. But already on the second one, already on the second one, it's almost the final result. Right? It's almost perfect at this point. The only thing difference between the second level and the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth is the deep deepness of the colors. That's it. But you can show the structure right away. Again, you can save on perceived performance here as well. Right? which is actually quite interesting. And if you want to do this kind of thing, but not necessarily play with matrices, these two uh, encoders have a really, really good um, quality settings suppressors that you can choose from. Actually, three of them. There is Adapt, then there is MosJPEG, which is my favorite at the moment. But of course, because our Swiss friends like bread and cheese, they came up with Goodsly next to Broadly, next to Zopfly. Thank you very much, by the way to our Swiss friends, uh, which is another JPEG encoder, which I highly encourage you to look up, look to. And then to finish that part up, what if you want something else? What if you have an image in a really bad quality, or pretty decent quality, but you need to display it on a large screen? That's not going to look great, unless you use machine learning and context-aware resizing and upscaling, which is let's enhance IO, uh, what's let's enhance IO is for. Essentially, you can take an image which is 300 pixels in width and make it look great at 1,000 pixels. <laughs> right? And it's done just by you know, context-aware resizing and blowing up things. It's just almost like magic. But it actually does work. I was very surprised. 
It really does work. So I highly encourage you to actually test it out. Okay. Now, before we finish up with the first part, <coughs> I just want to cover another thing which we haven't covered yet, which is web fonts. No dramatic effect here at all, right? You know, I remember the times when everything was simple and easy and you could just plug in a link inside of your HTML and it would be called web font loading. No, these times are over forever because now you need to really have your strategy of how to deal with web fonts. And there are many ways of how to, you know, of dealing with them, but there are also many new ways of knowing what we need to know in order to deal with them. Now, when we declare a web font, we need to declare font face first. And we, in the past, we used to use bulletproof font face syntax, which is not ne longer necessary. Uh, I don't know if many of you will remember the hashtag IEFIX thing. It was so dirty. And the reason why we were using it for a while is because, you know, Internet Explorer, our good old friend, supports EOT, but not necessarily everything else. So, however, if it discovers this kind of font face thing, and it you know, requests and gets its EOT file, it doesn't stop there. No, if it finds EOT and it has you know, WOF2, I'm going, it's going to download WOF2 and WOF and OTF despite it can never actually use it. So this is why we had this dirty IE fix thing as well, right? But now it's probably going to look like this. Where we have to use WOF2 and WOF and probably not even OTF anymore. Now, one thing we need to know is when a font family is used in CSS, browsers will match it against all font face rules, then download web fonts, and then display content. And this is why we have you know, a wonderful font family where we're actually defining or using the usage of that font. Right? And then we're going to load it, you know, for example, like this if we're using Typekit. Now, it's interesting to important to keep in mind what's happening when we actually do it. Uh, let me just jump a little bit here. Because different browsers have slightly different behaviors. So many of you will have encountered this, right? Because of link underlines first, everything on the web boils down to link underlines. It's always coming up first. And the reason for it is because web fonts, um, you know, it might take time until web fonts have downloaded. So different browsers used to have different behaviors. Now, uh, Safari's behavior has changed. Uh, but it used to be that in Safari, you would need to wait forever, literally forever, if there is something like looping or so. Um, until web fonts kick in, so you wouldn't be able to see anything until Safari actually gets this font. Uh, most of the time, the experience is though void, which is a flash of invisible text, but we don't display any content at all until the web font kicks in, right? And in some browsers, in IE, um, the experience is flash of unstyled text, where we show content in the fallback font first, and then we switch to web fonts. Now, why the hell am I telling you this? Well, because now the rules the, of the game have changed a lot. Now, in the past, it used to be like this. You have three seconds. If nothing shows up in Chrome or for Firefox, um, you will have a fallback font. And then as web fonts kick in, we're going to have a switch from a fallback font to web font. And it might take a while, but it's, you know, it's going to be um, it's still like that forever. Now, we used to have very, very different techniques to load fonts. And there is a font loading API and font load events, which is great. But we also thought about, hmm, maybe because everybody wants to come up with a nice fancy acronym like FOIT and FAULT and whatever, I thought, I can do that too. There's nothing wrong with me. I can do the same thing. And so we decided to call the new technique C2SFOFTRAWURISW, which you feel free to tattoo or do whatever you want with. But the idea is really simple. Well, it's not simple. Uh, the idea is, OK, we can use service workers, and I guess that many of you will have played with service workers already, um, to cache fonts, but we do it in two stages. On the first load, we load the critical, like you know, many of you will know critical CSS, above the fold CSS, this kind of thing. So what about applying the same idea to web fonts? Where the idea is, where we load a small subset of the font that we need most of the time, it's probably going to be just regular, right? And we'll load everything in regular. At the same time, we're downloading all the fonts, put them in the cache, in the service worker's cache, and then we have that switch. But everything is visible right away because we, you know, we are having a very small subset of that font that we need. And then we put it in the service worker, 
And the reason why it's fast is because we really subset it to the minimum. And the reason why it's two stages, because the first stage is that regular thing, everything in regular, and the second stage is everything properly set. And you might think, what the hell? This is just too complicated and ridiculous. Why don't we just use good old HTTP cache? And the problem is this article from 2007. How many of you remember it? Really? Okay, I feel so old now. I really remember this article really well because it changed so many things. Because in 2007, Yahoo decided to check how often do actually things stay in the cache when we put them in the cache. And what they found out, that 40 to 60% of Yahoo's users have an empty cache experience, although they should have files in the cache. So Facebook repeated the same exercise uh, two years ago, I think, three years ago now, and they found out exactly the same thing. Also 40 to 50%, uh, where was it? Mm. On average, 44.6% of users are getting an empty cache. They shouldn't be getting an empty cache, but they do. So why is this happening? What is wrong with us? Now, the reason is caching. So you know, all of our machines have limited memory, and they have limited CPU, and they have limited capabilities, and it also goes for storage. So whenever something gets in the cache, unless it's a really new machine that has never been used before, something has to leave the cache. And there are certain things that are first to leave the cache and certain things that are last to leave the cache. And when it comes to fonts, specifically, it's really, really unlikely that things are going to stay in the cache. There is only 16.9% cache on uh, chance on, oh, sorry, uh, there is a 56.7% chance that things that are in HTTP cache you know, still are web fonts, which means it's 56% out of 44%, which makes up for 21%, 22% of all the times when we're expecting things to be in the cache, and they will not be. Which also means, and this is why it's annoying, and sorry for such a long introduction, the reason here, the problem is, if this happens so often, that means that people will see the flickering from a fallback font to web font pretty much every fifth or sixth visit on your site, which is probably not what you want. Right? You want the files to be properly resiliently sitting in the cache, but they will not be, at least not with the HTTP cache. But they will be if you're using Service Worker. Right? This is the reason why we're actually using it. But I have good news. I do bring good news. And the good news is we don't need it anymore. <laughs> uh, namely, because there is this new fantastic property called Font Display Optional. But before we get there, I need to wake you up just a little bit. I was attending a party, and at the party we started having this little game about this little emoji. Right. Can you spot or guess the Unicode code for that emoji? That's really difficult. I know, I'm sorry. But this is really, really OK, I'm, I'm going to bring closer to you. Right. Anybody? Right. So it's a really fun game to play if you don't know Unicode. Uh, but there is a good news, there is good news. There is a book, Unicode book. This looks like this. It has all the Unicode symbols in the world. So, you know, what do you do if you need to look up? You know, probably everybody has this book on the coffee table, right? <laughs> so you're going to open it up and flip. So, and this is an incredible book, actually. A, B, See, it's a long book, so you can, you, know, you can really enjoy and explore all the Unicode symbols. I think it's a really fantastic thing. And guess what? After hours of trying to find that thing, yes. So good luck next time playing this game. So welcome, a wonderful 1F37B. Right? That's great. Now we know. Now we found out. Right? Uh, but of course, this is just ridiculous. Why would we want to do that? Well, because it can be useful in a few ways, as we will see in a second. But I want to finish up this one with this font display optional, which I think is something that we all should be using today as well, which kind of allows us to have more control about how web fonts are loaded. Namely, when we just add font display optional, it allows us to really be very granular about how we want fonts to download. So by default, it's block, which means Everything is going to be invisible for three seconds, like in most browsers, the experience that most browsers have. And then we are dropping to the fallback. And then eventually, when WebFont kicks in, we're going to have a switch. Then we have swap, which means 
Well, I'm going to show fallback right away, so no waiting at all. I'm going to show fallback right away. And then whenever web font kicks in, please swap. And then we have fallback, which means I give the browser 100 milliseconds to retrieve fonts from the cache or from, web font or from my service workers and display the content in that web font. And if it doesn't happen, I give it another three seconds. And if it doesn't happen within three seconds, then I'm never going to display web font. So I'm going to be fallback on the first visit. And then you have optional, which essentially means I give it 100 milliseconds and full stop. If nothing comes up after 100 milliseconds, I'm going to display um, the fallback font. So this is basically does everything consistently across browsers. So please go ahead and use it. And then here's one other thing that's also quite useful, because very often when you have a switch from a fallback font to web font, you have this jarring thing. Things get bigger or smaller, too big, too small. So you can actually adjust the X height or the font weight or whatever you want here by actually adding these two fonts and tracking the changes in the same text. It could be really helpful to avoid this jarring experience. And that's something that Monica Cindulescu did, and this is kind of the slides from her talk on fantastic web performance. If you want to learn a bit more about it, her talk was really, really incredible. Right? Okay. Well, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do I think we need a break. <laughs> and beer and stuff, and I'm hungry. Yeah, so I think that if you want to leave, that's okay. What I, the, the only thing I want to show you is what I want to cover next would be variable fonts. Uh, I have to escape here, just so you know. Uh, variable fonts and custom properties, kind of the best part, to be honest. <laughs> it's a bit sad. Uh, variable fonts, custom properties, and CSS grid layout, and a gem stack. So just in case you want to join, if not, that's okay too. But thank you so much for coming one way or another. So I hope to see, still see some of you in 15 minutes from now. Axel is going to kill me. <laughs> it's not like I care, but yeah. Okay, so hopefully see you in 15 minutes. I told you it can go all the way until 11. Okay, and thank you to Axel for the food, for the for Sipgate, for everything and for hosting me and everything. So I think it deserves some applause, maybe. <laughs> and also for being passionate with, patient with me because, you know, you think that we're half through. So we still have some work to do, but uh, that's going to be different now. Okay, so... Uh, what I want to show now are some of the important things that uh, you might have heard of before, but maybe not many of you have seen or have used so far. And there are just really a couple of interesting things to keep in mind there, especially because they are coming really ra rapidly. Now, one thing to note here is that all these things we're going to cover next, they might seem like, what the hell just happened? They were not here just you know, a month ago, and all of a sudden it's all available. Okay, it's a bit too much. Um, it's available today. That's just strange. And the thing is that the, sp the pace of technology and how it's adopted in browsers has changed dramatically. So like many of you will remember Flexbox going iteration after iteration after iteration until it got stabilized. Now it's you know, everywhere. But the thing with CSS grid layout, for example, happened much, much, much faster. And so the reason for it is because browsers, the way they implement things, actually many things are happening in the background. So maybe behind the flags, there are no prefixes anymore. Like we used to have minus hyphen webkit hyphen moss and others. It's all happening behind the browser as you actually use it, and so many things will be just ter get turned on on a given month because all the browsers just agree on it. That's remarkable, right, that browsers talk to each other. That's wonderful. And one of the things is variable fonts, and how many of you have heard of variable fonts before? Okay, so this is kind of the thing that really changes a lot in terms of how we're designing um, because it's really the browser support is here and some variable fonts, not that many, but some variable fonts are there as well. And some of you might have heard about the possibility. So what does it mean? Now many of you will remember this time, so we used to have web safe fonts. Sans serif and serif and maybe monospace and maybe cursive if we're really uh, creative. But these days it's really interesting to see that the complexity of typefaces has changed just as much as everything else has changed. Now this is just one of the families that contains 67 weights, right? 
where you can have pretty much everything from extra, extra, extra condensed to extra, extra ultra block, right? Really, really heavy or really, really lightweight. And of course, as you know from the previous web phone disaster monster thing, you know, we don't want to load all of these weights uh, in the, like, um, separately. It would be nice to have one phone file that would take care of everything. Now, it's really interesting that something that has been decided in web standards or the, not in, you know, with, uh, with CSS a while back, namely almost 20 years ago, is getting into action now. Hacken uh, Vium Lee, who is actually responsible for CSS, uh, designed a major part of it, um, he said that one of the reasons we chose to use three-digit numbers for the CSS font weight value, like, you know, in font weight you can choose 400, which is normal, but you can also use 300, 200, 900, and so on. And the reason why they chose it, because they wanted to support intermediate values as well. And that's now available. 20 years later, like 20 years ago, somebody made a decision that's going to actually help us get to where we want to be today. That's, that's almost like magical. Now, what's the problem there in the first place? Now, the problem is that the individual weights of a font family are stored in individual files. So we need to download bold, we need to get regular, we need to get bold italic, we need to get italic, right? And load them using font face as we saw before. So they all have to be requested, downloaded, and applied individually, and often various various formats, like WOF2, WOF, and others, right? Now, each weight, however, is a snapshot of the design space of a family. So again, we used to use, or we usually use regular italic, bold, and bold italic. That's it. But there is nothing in between. You can't say, I want to be a bit bolder, I want to be less bolder. This is it. This is what you're going to use unless you load a separate file for it. And it's a big problem, not necessarily just for us here, uh, like in, in Western Europe or in you know, North America. It's a big problem for Asia. Because if you look into Thai script, then if you look into Chinese scripts, you'll find a huge diversity of characters. And imagine loading all of them. There are many characters in these languages. I have to look up how many there are in here, because I wrote it down, and I did not... Oh, yes. There are... No, I don't have it here. Doesn't matter. But there are many, many, like hundreds of characters. And so we need to really think about loading this font because it's really, really slow if you load everything in bold and italic and in regular and in bold italic. And it's even worse in Chinese, right? <laughs> yep. this, this is a huge character set, which is again, by the way, where the Unicode book can be very useful. <laughs> Just saying. So looking into this, with variable fonts, we can actually solve this problem. Right, so we can use a much wider design space where we actually define masters, as they call the key points, and we can use hundreds of weights uh, without extra payload. For example, if we choose one of these fonts, like I say, Winner VF by Christoph Koberlin, right, uh, we can have we operate in different axes. So we have this regular axis, which is the weight axis. Like this is where font weight is coming from. It's like a low-level property for it. Um, and these slides are, by the way, are kindly um, provided by Lawrence from Axel Praxis, who is doing a lot of stuff of work in this space. So I'm just highlighting what he's doing. And so essentially we have this weight axis, which is the regular axis. And we can say I want everything from 1 to 1,000. So the only thing you need to do instead of loading every single weight is say, I want to define key masters. I'm going to define my, for example, my normal, which is going to be 500 at this point. It's like, usually it's 400, but let's just say we just call it this way. So you have one key um, design here, master design, and then you have another one that is bold, and then you might have another one, which is, for example, light, and so on, and regular, and bold, and black, and so on. And then you can do the same for the width axis, ranging again from 0 to 1,000, and you end up with this design space, right, which is spanned over these two axes, the weight axis and the width axis. Right? And then you can have any character of any width, of any height, and boldness and whatever you need, um, without any restrictions. So if you want 610 in weight and 920 in width, this is it. You can have it just by defining a few key masters, and everything in between is going to be interpolated. So interpolate in many different dimensions. It could be weight, width, it could also be X height, the grade, optical size, grunginess, contrast, whatever you want to give your typeface as a treatment. And one of the options is to do, for example, things like this. Can you think for a while, for a second, why it could be useful? So it's the same font, it's the same word, 
It's just the ligatures or the spacing or the weight or the width, they're all interpolated in between. Can you think of a second why it would be useful? Except that it looks cool. Now, one, one classical example is what if you have, a, say, a dollar sign on a really extra bold typeface? It might look really too thick on a small screen or on a large screen, so you might want to change and remove this, uh, the, 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 vertical, the, the vertical lines, the thickness of the lines, depending on you know, how much width you have, for example. Right? Now, if you look into variable and font implementation, there are different use cases, but essentially, it all boils down to defining it like this using font variation settings property. There are a couple of competing properties now, but essentially, it all boils down to just picking the right axis that you want to use. For example, if you want to render text with a variation that is very wide, has a light weight, and is optically sized for 48 points, right, you can just define it using these four, uh, four characters shorthands for width, for weight and optical sizing. And there are actually five of them, they're predefined, but you can also, as a type designer, you can also define any other, right? For example, the granginess and whatever. And you can even get access to it via JavaScript, which will be necessary in a second, right? Or you can just say, I want to change the font variation settings by giving this extra styling to a particular element, right? So you can, with, with WDTH, you define the width, you can also define the weight, you can also define if it's italicized or not, you can define the optical size, and if it should be slanted or not, right? And you can also define as a designer, type designer, custom axis, like granginess, granginess, for example, and everything else will be automatically generated. So this is why you see things like this, CKFR, which are not pre-written or not defined in web standards in the specification, but you can apply whatever you like because designer, type designer took care of it, right? And when we implement it, then what do we need to do? We need to consider three things, format, fallback, and responsive behavior. Because if we look in the browser support, this is what it looks like today, with it's coming in Firefox, I think, in May, if I'm not mistaken. So it will be supported widely in most browsers out there. Uh, we need to provide a fallback for i11 if you need to support i11. I think we all have to support it. But then also Opera Mini and you see browser and Samsung Internet, which is probably going to adopt it as well very soon. Now, how would you do it? So imagine, again, you would want to load that variable font. And it's just a web font. There is nothing magical about it. But you need to provide a fallback. Now, the fallback, the regular fallback, would be font weight property here, right? We just define it as you often do. And then you can redefine it. Font variation setting. So far with font variation settings property. It's kind of a low property, a low level setting, a low level property, which would override the font weight, right? Essentially, it translates when you write it this way into font weight 900, right? So they are equivalent here. Right? It's kind of the same thing. To define the font, you need to do form. Uh, sorry, format vof2 hyphen variations. Although it's actually this format type actually might change in the future, but essentially it's going to look like this, right? And you're loading only one font that contains all the stuff, right? But then we of course need a variable, non-variable fallback for browsers that don't support it. Because what happens if a browser tries to load a variable font that's not really supported? They will render. The problem is we don't know how they're going to look how the text is going to look, because you know, we just give it, leave it to the browser. And so what you would do then, you define this variable one on the top, and then you, oops, sorry, let's go back for a second. You define the variable font on the top, and then you define the fallback as source sans in here, so you load semi-bold and black and others. And when you load it, finally, you, would, you can say, I want to use source sans, which is non-variable font by default, but then if font variation settings is supported, I want to use variable font, right? And that's it. You don't need to do more than that, right? Now, when it comes to responsive behavior, it would be nice to be able to change the, sh kind of the thickness of a font depending on the width, for example. You can't really do it. However, you can still do some stuff with media queries in JavaScript. Now, when we look into variable fonts, very often you will see this model kind of being displayed. Designers like to think about variable fonts as being these multi-dimensional spaces where you can choose whatever typeface you want, uh, whatever font weight you want, or like this, where you can really adjust it. It's like a little game where you can actually play and choose whatever uh, character you need. Then in the end, it's all because of these two axes, right? Many, many of those things everywhere, right? Um, but essentially, 
it's there. The only problem with the use cases for it is that there are not that many variable fonts. Chances are, it's quite unlikely that your uh, foundry, type foundry you're using is going to have that font in, as a variable font, but it's been, it's been happening right now, so you should be expecting it by the end of this year for sure. And there are a couple of use cases. For example, you want to condense the width of a typeface for narrow columns, where you want to tweak the width, the weight for light type on a dark background, when you want to increase the X height maybe in small sizes. There are many micro optimizations you can actually go ahead and do. Right? And this is a really, really great point to just start playing with it. It's really not complicated. There's no magic there, right? Um, and it's called Axis Praxis. It has nothing to do with German language, by the way. Just really interesting to that it's called this way. So please go ahead and play with it if you want to. Okay. Another thing that's been kind of in conversation quite a lot is CSS custom properties and why the hell do we need it? It's kind of CSS variables. How many of you have heard of them before? Okay. How many of you are using them? That's not enough hands. Not enough hands. Now, I'm here to convince you that they're awesome and everybody, even people who don't understand what it means, should use it. Uh, so, logic fault or custom properties, what the hell is this now again? Now, it's been a very interesting development because, you know, we've been using, you know, if you're writing SAS or less or stylus or something, of course you know variables and of course you've been using them. And it feels like, so why do we need it in CSS? Because, you know, okay, it's nice to have them in CSS, but, you know, what's the point? Now, with CSS custom properties, we can do much more than just having variables like we do with all those preprocessors, or post-CSS, doesn't matter. Um, we can actually separate logic from design, creating a really interesting layout. So not, not visually, but structurally. And it all boils down to one single thing, which makes them very different. They are live. They are real life variables. All variable expressions and calc statements that use CSS custom properties will be recalculated when the variable is redefined. Unlike preprocessors, they have knowledge of the DOM and can be scoped to DOM elements. What does this mean? So this is how they're going to be defined. So you have a hyphen hyphen before they come in, and then you define the variable, in that case, grid gutter. You can think about local variables and global variables. If you put something on the root, it will be global, so it can be used by everything. If you put it inside of a div, let's say on footer, it will be active only on footer. So that means if you have a grid gutter on the root, and you have a grid gutter on the footer, the footer, the variable that lives in the footer, is local and locally scoped to that footer. While that variable we have in the top is actually global, right? And it also means that we can redefine it using media queries. So for example, if you create your layout and you have a gutter in a grid, right? And you say, well, I kind of want to increase it everywhere on, my, you know, on the site in terms of layout. Uh, whenever I start growing from 600 pixels upwards, you can just redefine that variable and you're kind of done. Because that grid doesn't have to be defined specifically for that layout. You can just say, okay, here's my variable that I have defined, right? And here I'm going to use for the grid get property, we'll get to the grid layout in a second, whatever value that variable has. Right? So if you have more than 600 pixels, this value is going to be 1.25 rams. If you have less than 600 pixels, you're going to have one ram. Right? So this is the idea of separating logic from design, because here you have the logic, and here you have the design. Right? And that's a really, really important and interesting thing to keep in mind. Now you can do it, use it in many different ways. And including like crazy ways for like reusing animation, for example. You can even refer variables to variables if you like. You have all kind of craziness going on. And even creating crazy, crazy things like greed that you might be using from Bootstrap, for example, um, with just a few lines. And here kind of playing with how many columns you want to have using, again, variables. And how many of you have played with CSS grid layout? All right, so this is a really, it sounds a bit scary at first, but it's really, really quite simple once you start kind of getting used to it. The magical thing about it, which is like mind-blowing when I think about it, if you want to design a layout today in CSS, you have to deal with floats and positioning and all this stuff, because you can write freaking ASCII to define your layout. This is, when I saw it for the first time, like, what? 
the hell is happening? So instead of saying I want to have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six columns, right? You can say I want to have a title div that's going or like title uh, area that's going to spend the entire first row, then a subtitle with an empty last column, and then the content area with the first four columns spent with two empty columns, and then you have a list and then you have a link, and this is kind of your layout. This is like crazy. And then you can say a particular div, like uh, features title, subtitle, and so on, will flow into that area. The title area, the subtitle area, and so on. <laughs> Magic. Just better, because it's real. Right? Um, so that's quite impressive. And you can combine it again with the custom properties to really make it even more flexible. And there's a really great article by Stuart Robson about it. Right? Um, a couple of things maybe to keep in mind is that if you need to convert unitless values, for example, if you defined unitless mean font size 15 here and 18 over here, right, you need to multiply it with whatever unit you're using, in that case, one pixels, to turn 15 into 15 pixels. You can't just say, I'm going to take that value and then you know, attach, con concatenate px to it. This is not going to work. You have to actually multiply it with one pixel, one m, if you want to use m's. Right? And of course, it's a really great case for things like theming. You have, let's say, dark mode, light mode, or you use some kind of boxes with different background colors. This is going to be great. That's the one we're using on the smashing side, right? where you have these boxes, and they are for different, like, different members have different privileges, so to say. And so here we have different uh, shades of a particular background color. So instead of redefining it over and over again, we're separating logic from design again. So this is the markup. We have an unordered list, and you have a, you know, one thing for members, starting from members, then one thing starting from supporters and others. Right? And then you're defining the fold, where you're defining the logic here. You can say, I want to have a box color dark gray and box background color white. And then if it's high contrast, and it's kind of using SAS here, then the box color is going to be black. Right, and you define all this logic, and you redefine all these variables right, for different classes in different cases. And then the only thing you need to do in your CSS, actually, is to actually refer to whatever background color is going to be used with whatever color is being used as well. And based on whatever we have here, this is where the logic lives, the right color will be used. It really saves a lot in CSS. And then, of course, it's a good idea to provide some fallback, and this is done by using comma, and then you have a fallback right here. And if it's not supported, the syntax is not supported, yeah, of course, you also need to provide background color as a, on its own here, right? And even for things like animation, because if you look into you know, this effect here, how would you actually do it? This is kind of slowed down. It's really not that hard. And again, you don't want to kind of repeat the same thing over and over again. So the way it works is you refer on that promo boxes box on the linear, like a background image, which is the linear gradient going to right from gray to whatever color is defined in the logic. Right? That's it. You don't have to redefine it for every single thing. And the way it works is you have a background size of 200%, which kind of spans it up kind of blots it up twice in, in the width, and then the first 50% is going to be gray, and then in addition to whatever color has been defined early on. Right? It's more like a bit being a bit more programmatic and logic, adding some logic to your design. And you might be wondering, what about browser support? No reason not to use it, I would say. The only thing you need to do, of course, is provide fallback for IE and Opera Mini. Right? So that's pretty cool, too. And I think that many developers will We'll do a lot of stuff with this stuff already because there are so many opportunities. Like one of the things that really had been bothering me for quite some time is the fact that you can't really change the parts of an SVG freely with CSS. There is no way for doing it. If you want to have a multicolor SVG, you actually have to really style it. You can't really change it on hover, for example. So you can have this or this. Oh, sorry, but not this. And specifically, you can also change all parts of the SVG. How many of you have encountered this problem before? A few people? So I'm going to change your life forever now. So get ready. So and the way you would usually do it is you define the SVG as a symbol, and then you want to reuse it using use here. right? So you define this my first icon. Now is a more magic moment when I'm going to show off. So you have the my first icon over here, and then you have a reference to it over here. So essentially, you're creating this SVG over here, and then you're going to use it in multiple places, because you can. 
right? Uh, you might want to use the same icon in different places. So you might want it to be red, you might want it to be blue, right? And so how would you do it normally? You would say, okay, and either the entire icon in red at this point or the entire icon in blue. I can't just target a particular path. So you would use fill property here, right? Probably. Um, now, if you want to change the icon, every single icon, we can't do it because we can't do things like this. Some of you might have seen this before if, or tried this before. You have different paths and then you have a class, path one, path two, path three, right? And then here you might want to try to say, I want to fill that particular path in red, the other one in green, and the other one in blue. It's not going to work. And if you look into the spec, which is a fantastic reading material to read on Sunday evenings, I highly encourage you to do that. You'll find out that we're trying to style path one, two, and three as if they were nested inside of icon colors container, but they're not. The use element isn't a placeholder that gets replaced by your SVG definition. It's a reference which clones the content that it's pointing to into the shadow DOM. Whatever. All right? But, but, oh, champagne. I'm totally up for it. Uh, because, you know, custom properties. Yeah. So, in fact, however, we can get access to it if we say, hmm, I'm going to path, fill, and use whatever color is defined for each of them, color one, color two, color three, and I'm going to define them in my CSS as you know, properties, custom properties as color one, color two, and color three, and this is just, just the magic. And if you need to have some sort of alternate icon with another color, you just redefine it and you're done. You just add that class, icon colors alt, and you're done. So finally, we solved it. We can have some coffee, which is not all blue or red. And it can go further than that. We just need to be crazy enough to implement it. So one of the problems that we often had in the past are this intrinsic ratio for videos. If you want to have 16 to 9 or 4 to 3, you need to create a box inside of a box with a padding hack. Some of you know it? Yes, right? That's like, I don't want to. How can you sleep at nights if you know that you built it this way. <laughs> you can have nightmares. It's really horrible. It's, but you know, it, it worked. And this is what it looks like, just in case you're wondering. So you have this box, and then you kind of add whatever ratio you need to have with padding bottom or padding top. And then it spans and occupies all of the space, right? That element that you want to stretch. And this article, this technique, is so old. It's 2009. It's about time to solve it. And then, of course, what if you have dynamic content in it? Of course, one thing if you have images, but if you have text, you might run into problem because if you have a very short text, this is going to work, no problem. But if you have long text, it's going to cause an overflow. That's not what we want. So there are techniques, like one of them is instead of having that extra element, you can actually use a, a pseudo element before or after. So if you want to do it, by the way, ratio body is really not known, but it's a really great resource. You just say whatever ratio you want to have and it spits out whatever code you need for it. That's really, really super cool. And it uses this pseudo-element tactic. I really like the names that people come up with sometimes. It's really, really cool, interesting. But the idea is the same. You have this padding top, or padding bottom, doesn't matter. And then you can use the after to clear the float. And essentially, you float and put the content inside of that box. And then you end up with this as an experience, right? That's great. But then it kind of leaves in your CSS. And whenever you need to change the aspect ratio, you would need to you know, have an extra class for that aspect ratio. Or not, because you can do this. Potentially, I'm not saying that this is the best way of doing it, but potentially you could say, I'm going to define whatever, you know, parameter I need, or custom property I need, aspect ratio, 16 to 9, 4 to 3, anything else. And then in my CSS, the only thing I need to do is to say, mm-hmm, 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 padding bottom, whatever is defined in that custom property. Right? So you don't really need to redefine it from, you know, multiple times. So that's pretty cool. So it's just you know, up to us to find out when we can actually go ahead and use it. Of course, you can do this as well, but that's like, who wants to do that, right? Which brings me to one of the last ones, I think. Well, I have two more, but this one is short. Which is the vertical rhythm, something that many of us wanted desperately especially if you're a designer, I think where well, you might want to everything to be sitting on the right spot. Right? So you have this grid, and you don't want to things to be a bit broken, or kind of hanging in the, in, you know, in the air. Like here, that button over here, that just doesn't, right? 
You know, it's supposed to be either one and a half or two, but not, you know, just whatever. So it has to be sitting right, just like this, just to be right, right? Sitting on the right spot. So the text should be sitting, I mean, on the right spot, like right where the line starts. And we can't see it now, too bad. But it does, right? So in the past, we used to have really crazy techniques with all of the craziness that goes with it. It was really, really dirty. I don't even want to go through all of it. But today, we can do something different. Let's imagine you have this layout. It's a very simple layout. There's nothing magical going on here. And you have an article which contains a heading, right, and the paragraph, and then H2 and H3 and so on. Right? Again, this is what I do when we actually write CSS. You could say, OK, so I have this thing. So how am I going to create this magical thing over here? Well, as we always do, you have HTML, have body, and then I mean, you might define this gutter that we were talking about as a custom property here. Could be one RAM plus, plus two vmins. Vmins meaning the minimum between the one VW and VH, which are the new units that are also available in CSS and refer to the viewport width and height. And then you define that how you're going to use it. So here, as you can see, we're using add supports. If you've been using modernizer in the past, you can just kill it and replace it in many ways, in many cases. Don't take my word for like, you know. But in many cases, you can avoid modernizer altogether just by using add supports, which actually tests if a given feature, like display grid over here, is actually supported in the browser. And if it is, this thing is going to be applied. Now, what's happening here in the article, you're defining a grid layout with columns, and you give these columns names, which is what brackets stands for. Full width start, full width end, content start, content end, and others. And then you're defining the gap between rows, right, with grid row gap. And then you're referring to whatever gutter is defined in the logic, in the logic that you have, right? You can also use here, I will get to it in a second, the character unit. How many of you have used the character unit before? It's about time we use character unit. So the character unit represents the width of the I know, so much stuff. Uh, represents the width of the character zero in the current font, or particular case in combination with monospace fonts. What does it mean? Now, normally, we want to have a very limited length, line length. Maybe 65 characters, maybe 80 characters, it doesn't matter. But we want to have a predictable length. That length has to actually be based on, you know, on whatever font we're using. And if you want to achieve this, for example, with a nice comfortable line length for comfortable reading, we can use that CH unit in our layout. This is, by the way, the browser support for CH unit. So please go ahead and start using it. Because what we can do now is say, huh, I want to create 12 columns. This is what repeat is for. I'm repeating that pattern, min, max, or whatever, 12 times. Right? So I'm creating 12 column grid here. Right? And here, Specifically, I'm using this min max property, which says just make each column at least zero pixels, but at most 4.85 uh, characters, which is going to end up with 60, 65 characters per line. Right? And it's going to be consistent because it actually refers to whatever width you have in your font. Right? And the only thing you need to do, which is left then, is everything that lives inside of an article has to flow into this content area, which is spanned through this grid. Right? And essentially, just the only thing that you need then to have left is to have this margin, which is going to kind of uh, create an offset on the top and on the bottom. And essentially, just based on that, you create this for free. It's like maybe 10 lines of CSS or so. And it's always just right. You don't need to have all kind of this crappy magical thing with tons of vertical stuff. Uh, stuff for vertical uh, inquiry. And this is exactly what we're using here on Smashing as well, by the way. We're using that grid layout, breaking out after... Oh, this is, by the way, the most clicked button ever. <laughs> I will get to it in a second. It really says it uh, does nothing. People click on it like crazy. It's unbelievable. And then here we have this you know, grid layout that I was talking about, which does exactly this. So if you look into it, so we have, I don't know how many columns we have here. Can you click on that thing, on any of them, please? Anything? No? No? OK, maybe not. OK. But you can create all this stuff literally for free. So you don't really need Bootstrap if you're using it only for, uh, for grid layout. Right? So you kind of span the columns and then put content inside. 
That's it. That's the only thing you need to do. And then you're using grid template property for it, which looks like this. Oh, grid template columns. It looks like this. It's really, really simple if you actually start playing with it. You also will encounter some problems. For example, this in H13, just in case, you know, if you're playing with grid already, you need to know that if you want to support for support of display grid, you can't rely on it because there are some browsers that kind of support grid, but really creatively. <laughs> right? Really creatively. One of them is H13 or 14, right? Where they do support grid, just not right. So if you test for support of CSS grid layout, it will say, that, yes, it's supported, but it's not really supported in a good way. So in order to get around it, it took me going for every single CSS grid property to find out if you use, instead of display grid at the top, at support grid gap zero, it works just fine in Edge, right? So you're welcome, all right? Whew. So we're almost done. The only last thing is the delivery. And there are just a few things that I think important to share here. And it has to deal on how we used to lower things in performance stuff. And then I will be done, I promise. Uh, let me just jump a little bit here, otherwise it will take ages. Uh, OK, here we go. And it has to deal with how we can serve content faster, right? And it's also known the critical CSS, critical path, and other things. Now, many of you will might have heard about this cutting the mustard technique. How many of you have heard of it? Anybody? Well, this is like a good technique for loading SS fast. And it's been quite popular for many, many, many years, but not anymore for one particular reason. The reason is it doesn't really target what we want. Now, this is how it went, where you have essentially uh, it's a test, feature detection test, where you can say, if these three features are supported, then you detected a modern browser, and you're going to load all the modern assets. Not supported, then you're in this horrible, horrible legacy land. So you, you can load less JavaScript or more JavaScript, probably less, hopefully less. Um, and we could also replace it by checking for visibility state API, because there are tons of APIs that uh, are actually available out there. So it gives you this cut, just for testing for page visibility API. So if you don't really need to actively support A9, then that could actually work well. But it's not working anymore because we have really, really cheap Android devices which run Chrome, which is a very good browser. I think that all of us will agree, despite what we might think about you know, Google things. Uh, this is a good browser, so it supports pretty much everything that we want to play with. But this device is really has a really slow processor really low amount of memory available, and probably really not that much storage. So it's a really bad device with a really good browser. So you can't really deduce capability of that device from browser version anymore. Right? So we need to figure out something else. Right? Um, we can actually target low-end phones, and there are many APIs that Google has been coming with now, where you can actually even test for network and reliably say, OK, that network speed is 3G, or is likely to be 3G, or that thing has a real low device memory, and this is why I'm going to serve it less JavaScript or less CSS and so on. And Google has been actually quite vocal about running tests. If you're running performance today, performance optimization today, one of the really important devices to keep in mind is Moto G4, which is kind of a mid, mid to low range Android device, um, which really actually accurately represents the average device that we have out there. Because the discrepancy between the fastest device out there and the slowest device out there is remarkable. If you compare that average phone that most people in the world will have, like an average, you'll find out that for parsing JavaScript, it needs 12 times more time than an iPhone 8. So if you look at the iPhone 8, right, this one needs or maybe even more than 12 times here although it's a really you know, good browser and things. So this is what's really, really costing time. So at this time today, it's not really about you know, loading time. Loading time as a metric is not really important. It's about parsing and executing JavaScript, which given because of the you know, React and all of the single page applications, has become a major, major bottleneck. So if you look at the regular website, you'll find that there is nine second difference because of parsing and executing JavaScript, although assets are, you know, it's happening on the same connection. That's quite remarkable, right? So 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and if we look into the state of JavaScript on mobile, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad because we serve like 90th percentile of websites are serving one megabyte of JavaScript. It takes a lot of time to parse, really a lot of time. In fact, your, your website is probably quite fast because you know, you're, you're interested in this web stuff and everything. Because most websites on 3G, uh, I think it's just like, um, no, it's actually on cable, most websites, 90th percentile, will need 35 seconds, not to be loaded, but to be interactive, meaning that you can actually click on the button and something will happen, except our button. Nothing happens in our button, I promise you. Right? So 35 seconds, that's a lot of time. And in fact, sites use only 40% of the JavaScript they load up front. There's a lot of opportunity for saving stuff, right? So if you look into it, Google has come up with a budget that you might want to use, which is not a lot of time. So you have five seconds to get the time into interactive when you can actually click on any element that's visible, and then you can actually expect some result. And five seconds on a $200 Android phone on a slow 3G network emulated at this speed, right? Five seconds. And this is really, really not much because 1.6 seconds is gone because of all the technical, like the network stuff. DNS lookup, TCP handshake, HTTPS handshake, and so on. So you have only 3.4 seconds, which actually results in 170 kilobyte being your budget to load the most important chunks of your, applica of your application. That includes the framework, the router, the state management, the utilities, the critical path, CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. That's not a lot of budget to play with. Right? And if you want to get there, essentially you need to do all these fancy things that many people, many of you will have heard of before, like web park, chunking, um, code splitting, all of this stuff. Right? Um, which is, I don't know, I, I mean, I know companies that now invest in hiring a senior webpack engineer, engi um, setup or whatever they want to call. A person who does nothing that, you know, taking care of webpack. It's a little bit too much, maybe. But yeah, this really gains some significant performance improvements, right? And in fact, this is why many companies do things like this, for example. Like Shopify has a dedicated 3G network, and all customers are encouraged to use it, to load, you know, to use Shopify. Um, so they can actually see what many customers, or most customers, will, what their experience is going to be like. Facebook is even, even nicer. They say, let's have 2G Tuesdays. Why shouldn't every customer or every person working in Facebook work on 2G on a Tuesday? That sounds reasonable. Would you like to work on, t on 2G? No? Well, if you work on 2G for a while, you'll find out that, yeah, you can be, you know, it's really not fast, right? And then you will have to optimize the experience, right? Uh, now, there are a couple of things that I want to bring over here, though. We're all bundling JavaScript and all this stuff. If you're bundling today with HTTP2, please keep in mind that the best way of doing it is probably to have approximately 8 to, N, eight to 10 packages that you want to serve. In HTTP2, everything is happening in parallel. So we're told that you can, it's a good idea to serve like as many assets as you can. It's a good idea for compression, especially using Brotly, Zopli, Zipli, uh, Zipli, Gzip, and others, to actually make use of the dictionary. So please, like 8 to 10 packages. For CSS, there is one really dirty way of speeding things up, I'm sorry, I really f almost finished. Um, namely, in the past, we used to just load a style sheet like this, minify, compress, go, right? Not good enough anymore. We changed the critical CSS, where you load as much of the critical, important stuff for your CSS to increase perceived performance fast. And so you would load this kind of critical stuff first in line in the header, and then everything else. And in HTTP2, how many of you are running HTTP2? Okay, if you don't, please do, or at least like move to HTTPS, because starting from July, Google is going to show all non-HTTPS websites as not secure with a red flag. I don't want that on my site, right? I was working with, okay, please don't put it online. I was working with the European Parliament, and all the, there was this news that you know we have HTTP2 or HTTPS coming up. It's kind of HTTPS is essentially mandatory at this point. There is no way out, and you know European Parliament. Not all websites that the European Parliament had was running on HTTPS, and they had a lot of legacy. As a European Parliament, you do not want to have a non-HTTPS website, okay? Especially given that it might be marked as non-secure. 
Now, what seems to be working really nicely today, and this is what you could try just to see how it, what impact it has on performance, is to load things conditionally. So when you need a header, you load header CSS just before it. When you need an article, you load article CSS just before it. The same for comments and so on. It's really bad for old browsers, but it seems to be working really well for new browsers. So this is what the experience is going to be, with this progressive approach on the left and without on the right. Right? Where just on the left, things appear one after another, but they appear, seem to appear faster. While on the right, we're waiting for all the CSS to be delivered until we actually display the site. Right? And another thing that's also I would like to encourage you to use are resource hints. And there are a couple, but the most important one is preload. And the basic use case for preload is loading of late discovered critical resources or things that are not necessary right now, but will be necessary soon. And this is what it looks like. It's just HTML tag, nothing magical here. It's a link rel preload, and whatever JavaScript you need, a script, right? Then it's going to be downloaded with a, low, with a high priority, right, in the background. By the way, uh, where's preload? It's not really that well supported, but it's actually getting there, and browsers that use it can only benefit from it. And the reason for it is this, why I'm showing this, is this article, which I will never, ever, ever, ever forget. How many of you remember this article? OK, not many people. That's OK. I have only one minute left anyway. It's just 9 o'clock. OK. Uh, right, so this article was really, really important because it changed a lot in how we actually write stuff. Because what Google has been doing for Gmail you say, OK, we need to render fast, and we need to parse fast, and we need to execute fast. But as you, you know, uh, we don't need much of the, most of the JavaScript we've written on the very first load. So what can we do? Now, what if, just as an idea, right? What if we comment everything we don't need initially, right? And then when we need it, we uncomment it and evaluate it using eval in JavaScript. You might feel sick at this point, and you should be right, but it's exactly what it does. So you just need to make sure you strip out all the comments first before doing that, right? And then essentially, that's exactly what they've been doing for quite some time. And they were able to move from 206, uh, 2,600 milliseconds delay or parsing time for 200 kilobytes of JavaScript to 240 milliseconds. And given that most websites serve one megabyte but use at least, like at most, 30% of it, maybe it's a good idea to do it as well because you can do it with preload. I tested. You can do exactly the same thing. We can again, generate the grabbing of that thing, thing, so it's going to be downloaded and requested in parallel. And then whenever you need it, you just add it to the DOM and you ex it's going to be executed. So it's essentially like this dirty technique that Google Gmail was using just here. Uh, well supported, and because it's preload, you can also misuse it for, for example, conditional loading of things, right? We can say, I'm going to load that image for at most 600 pixels, and starting from 601, I'm, not going, I'm going to request the JavaScript file. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so this is the stuff that's been happening, and I want to just wrap up. <laughs> yes, wrap up, I really do wrap up, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, with this one thing that's been kind of the story of my life for, for the last two years or so. And it's been always the same thing. And it's always really impossible to track things because things are just totally out of control all the time. This has been the story of my life. And so don't worry if things aren't right or you don't understand them. There will be time for anything, everything. That's my life, Axel. That's just mean. <laughs> For designers. <laughs> 
That's just sad. So even if you didn't get like some of the techniques were maybe too fast or some technologies too fast, that's okay. You'll have time, you know, to make sense of it if you want to. And if not, there are cats. There are always cats. So with this in mind, thank you for being here, and thank you for Axel again and Sipgate for hosting us. Uh, and this is the end. Thank you.